Shortly after disappearing from her home in Anchorage, Cynthia Hoffman's family was confronted with the grim realization that she had been murdered in cold blood. But her killer, who had orchestrated a plan to take her down, was far from the usual person you would suspect. And moving forward, detectives realized that she was not the only one involved. So, who murdered Cynthia Hoffman? Who was the puppet master behind her pack of killers? And how did $9 million become involved? Welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at an insane story that involves a catfish, $9 million, and the world's worst haircut to date. And coming from someone who sported this lockdown hair, you know it's going to be terrible. By the way, Coffee House Crime is all about true crime, strange and chilling stories, and the best way to support me is by subscribing to the channel. So, if you like true crime, caffeine, or Nero, then please subscribe now. I also try to respond to most comments in the first hour of my videos going live, so if you want to catch me, please do subscribe and hit the bell notification too. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Cynthia Hoffman. Welcome to Alaska, folks. Today, we're traveling along the southern coast of the last frontier state to its largest city known as Anchorage. Home to a little under 300,000 residents, Anchorage plays a crucial role in Alaska's key industries, including oil and gas, transportation, and tourism. Now, I emphasize tourism because this city has a unique contrast of urban vibrancy and untamed wilderness. Found between the rugged Chugach Mountains and the waters of the Cook Inlet, it serves as the gateway to Alaska's jaw-dropping natural wonders. And with snowy winters and mild summers, it is perfect for outdoor explorers and skiers alike. Wildlife is found almost everywhere here, with majestic moose roaming the city's outskirts and bald eagles soaring overhead. And as for Anchorage itself, well, it is more than just a city. It is a melting pot filled with diverse communities, where many Alaskan traditions meet a more modern way of life. Visitors can explore bustling downtown streets, dine on locally inspired cuisine, and immerse themselves in its warm hospitality. However, saying that, there is a dark side to Alaska too. You may already know this, but this state has the highest combined violent and property crime rate in the US, standing at a staggering 33 crimes per 1,000 people in 2022. Just think about that for a moment. That means that more than 3% of people living here personally experience violence or theft every single year. But still, this case would outrage the nation to its very core. On that note, we begin our story today with the beautiful life of Cynthia Hoffman. Born on October the 8th, 1999, Cynthia was introduced to this world by her mother, Barbara, and father, Timothy. She was part of a large family of 11, with eight other brothers and sisters. And of course, this naturally meant that the Hoffman household was absolutely hectic. Cynthia attended the ACE or ACT program shortly after graduating from Robert Service High School, a program that provides communication, social skills, independent living, and vocational skills training in the community. The ACT program is a post-secondary community-based program for adult students needing additional transitional support. And that's because Cynthia had some developmental disabilities and had been diagnosed to have the mental development of a 12-year-old. This meant that she sometimes required additional support, but that never stopped her from doing anything that she wanted. Cynthia fiercely desired to be accepted by her friends, and had an even larger ambition to live a happy and fulfilled lifestyle. She would work in restaurants in her spare time, but it is said that her favourite job was with her father, and she would work alongside him in his business, which is known as Hoffman Handyman and Repair Services. Cynthia was described as a young woman with a kind heart, and was a friend to many people around her. Sadly, though, as you will soon realize, she was also incredibly trusting of her friends, and unfortunately, some of those would use this to their advantage. One of those fortunate enough to know Cynthia was a young woman named Denali Bremer, and sadly, much like our recent case of Brittany Gargle, Denali was not cut from the same cloth. As one of five daughters in the Bremer household, Denali was the middle child, and tragically, all five experienced both neglect and abuse. Their lives were in total disarray, and eventually, all of them were removed from the care of their mother, with the violence peaking when the man living with their mother killed their two-month-old baby sister, Gabrielle. 
The abuse experienced at home was enough to leave Denali with some lingering trauma, and moving into teenagerhood, the one sweet girl turned towards a more rebellious lifestyle. Now, her adoptive family gave her plenty of opportunities to break the cycle, but unfortunately, Denali couldn't help herself. And moving forward, she began to hang out with people who didn't care about her, and she made some very tragic decisions. Now, despite her reckless choices, Denali did make friends with some rather good people. Of course, this including Cynthia. The two would eventually meet at school, and were described by some friends around them as two peas in a pod. Her father recalls the day that Cynthia ran home to tell him about a friend she had made at school. But little did he or anyone else know at that time that Denali was a bad apple. Speaking of friendships made, Denali spent a fair amount of time online. And in the winter of 2018, while trawling online and looking for a date, she came across a monster in disguise and his name was Tyler. Now, Tyler, also known as Angel on several forums, disguised himself as a 21-year-old multimillionaire who lived in Indiana. And over the next few months, Tyler and Denali struck up an online relationship. They would talk for hours every day, and it was clear that Denali had fallen in love with him. But little did she know that Tyler was not actually his real name, and his pictures were not him either. The man's real name was Darren Schillmiller, and although Darren was truthful about living in Indiana, almost everything else was a lie. He had no money, no chiseled jawline, or any washboard abs. In fact, he was just a corrupt man, literally alone in his grandmother's basement. Darren grew up in a small town named Salisbury, with a population of no more than 700. Former classmates described him as an incredibly shy young man who seemed to struggle in school, saying that he did seem to treat others well, and was more likely to be bullied than to bully others. But he was highly odd as an individual. Younger classmates recall him often asking them for bikini photos, and he would also try to talk to classmates who didn't want to know him using fake profiles. To make things even stranger, he would also ask his classmates' parents if they could send him images of their children. As Darren developed into an adult and began to date women online, his requests became even stranger. He would often ask single parents to send him photos of dirty diapers, but with a fake name and profile picture, nobody ever knew who Darren actually was. From his computer chair, Darren or Tyler could pretend to be anything he wanted. He had multiple profiles and accounts to help keep him anonymous. Now, as some of you will know, this practice of assuming a fake identity to engage in relationships online is commonly referred to as catfishing, and sadly, it is one that Denali fell for. And through the course of 2019, while he forged a relationship with Denali Brahma, he slowly coaxed her into the idea of performing the most violent and terrifying of actions, all of which would be performed on his behalf. In April of 2019, Tyler told Denali that if she were to sexually assault and then murder someone and record the entire thing for him to see, then he would reward her with $9 million. Now, I don't claim to be a psychologist or a couples counsellor, but if I were to try and spot red flags in a relationship, I think I would say that that's one of them. However, Tyler's sadistic demands did not seem to phase Denali whatsoever. In fact, she seemed to like and lean into the idea in the coming weeks. And moving forward, she would become the operation's mastermind. By May of 2019, Denali had recruited four of her friends to help carry out the murder. And tragically, Tyler had targeted her best friend Cynthia to be the victim. And in June of 2019, Denali's evil scheme, which she'd been planning with several of her friends for the last few weeks, finally came into fruition. June the 2nd, 2019. It was a mild and overcast summer's day in Anchorage, with temperatures peaking at 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 16 Celsius. After waking up, Cynthia was surprised to see an invite from her best friend, Denali, asking if she wanted to go hiking later that day. Cynthia gladly accepted the offer, and so, later on in the afternoon, she was picked up by Denali, who had also planned to drive Caden to Thunderbird Falls. Now, Thunderbird Falls is a beautiful waterfall located around half an hour from town. It is a fairly popular destination for tourists all year round, and being at the perimeter of Chugach State Park, it has plenty of open space to be alone. 
after following the path for a short while. The three of them then went off trail and followed a path along the bank of Eklutna River. But unknown to Cynthia at the time, this hike did not have the best of intentions. In fact, it was a trap. Denali had accepted Tyler's demands, who, at the moment, was on the other end of her phone, giving her direct orders to kill Cynthia. And so, after making enough ground to be miles away from any other living person, Cynthia was ambushed to the floor. Denali and Caden tackled her before binding her hands and feet with duct tape, and after binding her mouth shut and receiving the final order, Cynthia was shot in the back of the head. Shortly after, her body was dumped in the river. In a crude attempt to throw the authorities off track, Denali then used Cynthia's phone to message her parents. She claimed that she was meeting friends at Polar Bear Park, which is found on the other side of town. Denali then deleted all messages between them off of her phone, before gathering Cynthia's belongings, traveling to Lions Park and Mountain View, and burning all of it. By sundown, Cynthia's parents were beginning to grow worried. Not only was she nowhere to be found, but she'd stopped responding to text messages and phone calls too. Now, this is one of my biggest bugbears in any sort of missing persons operation, but Cynthia's father was told that he could not report her as missing until 24 hours after she disappeared. Now, I totally get that police departments can become overwhelmed with unnecessary work, but the thing is, a missing persons case can turn out to be the most severe of crimes, and those 24 hours are crucial for evidence. Timothy and the rest of Cynthia's family went out to look for her during this time frame, but sadly, they found no sign of her whatsoever. At 11.30 a.m. the following morning, they were able to finally report her as missing to the authorities, confirming that her last known whereabouts was falsely Polar Bear Park. Although Denali had successfully thrown the authorities off their tracks for now, it seems like she and Caden were not actually that smart after all, because on that very same day, the authorities became privy to some rather concerning information. And that's because, on that very same day, someone had phoned the authorities to report that Denali had apparently shot someone. Apparently, she had confessed to murdering someone on Snapchat, with the message reading, I just want to thank everyone that's been there for me my whole life and these past few years and everything. I fucked up, I know I did. If I could take back what I've done, I can't. I am sorry everybody, my family, my friends. I guess you will hear from me when you hear from me, but I won't be back for a long time. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to do it. So, that was how the authorities learned of Denali Bremer and her friend Caden McIntosh. And after taking them down to the local police station for questioning, their story began to unravel. Shortly after, officers checked the riverbank along Thunderbird Falls, and sadly, that is where they found Cynthia's lifeless body. With that said, it became evident to them that there was no chance of survival. As a result, Denali Bremer was arrested and charged on suspicion of murder and tampering with evidence. Meanwhile, Caden McIntosh faced the same two charges a few minutes later. Now, initially, Denali claimed that Cynthia's death was entirely accidental, Apparently, the three had agreed to hike Thunderbird Falls and take pictures of the river. She also claimed that, apparently, after arriving, the three decided to tie each other up with duct tape. You know, the most normal of thing to do with friends. Cynthia allegedly volunteered to go first, but began to panic after being bound. That is when Denali took the tape off of her mouth, but Cynthia was not calming down. Cynthia then threatened to call the police, reporting that she'd been kidnapped and sexually assaulted. That is when Caden grabbed Denali's gun and shot her in the back of the head. Denali tried to convince the officers that she had no intention of murdering or hurting Cynthia, and that she was only following Caden's demands because she feared for her own life too. However, when officers highlighted that they already knew who Tyler was, Denali knew the game was up. In his own police interview, Caden claimed that he blacked out during the encounter, and just after everyone agreed to bind Cynthia with duct tape. He would eventually admit to shooting her, but he wasn't sure if she died from the gunshot or from drowning. 
The story gets a little more complicated here. But after authorities learned that Caleb had provided the truck to Denali to murder Cynthia, he too was arrested on suspicion of murder and tampering with evidence. Two other juveniles were also arrested and then transported to a youth center, but with them being so young, their names are not publicly available. Caleb was also arrested with assault and sexual abuse of a minor after the authorities learned that he had assaulted one of them. But the real shock was when the authorities learned of this story's most instrumental killer who wasn't at the crime scene, wasn't in the same state, or even real for a matter of fact. As Denali began to break down and provide the truth in the interrogation room, they learned of this so-called millionaire named Tyler. She admitted that she had been promised $9 million if she were to murder her best friend. To add to this, Denali offered a 10% cut to each of the four friends that she recruited, meaning that she herself would bag just over $5 million in the end. But when digital forensic officers began to look into Tyler's profile, they realized that not everything was as it seemed. After being granted a search warrant for Denali's phone, officers found a string of messages attached to a phone number which was under the name Tyler or nickname Babe. And within these messages, officers would find explicit content of children, incriminating both Denali and this so-called Tyler. But the phone number associated with Tyler actually belonged to somebody else, a man named Darren Chilmiller. And once Denali realized that this man had catfished her, she did not hold back on her story. On June the 9th, seven days after Cynthia's murder, Darren was contacted by federal agents along with Indiana State Police. Without any restraint whatsoever, the twisted man admitted to absolutely everything. He told detectives that he knew that Denali and Cynthia were best friends, and that, furthermore, he told Denali that she had to murder her. And so it soon became clear to the authorities that Darren was the puppet master of the entire operation here. He catfished Denali, coaxed her into his dark fantasies, bribed her with extortionate amounts of money that he never had, and then got her to record the entire thing for his pleasure. But even after the murder, Darren was not finished with her. He then further tried to blackmail Denali into assaulting other people, and only after she refused to give in to his demands, he ghosted her. The aftermath left behind in Cynthia's death was absolutely tragic. On June the 13th, 2019, hundreds of people gathered at the Faith Christian Community Church on Wisconsin Street for her funeral. Dozens of motorcyclists escorted the hearse carrying Cynthia to the service. Her father, Timothy, rode his motorcycle behind it. During opening remarks, Tim asked the audience to try to keep the remembrance of his daughter joyful. In an emotional statement, he said, I don't want this reunion to be a sadness. I want it to be a new birth of my daughter. I have a court appearance at 8.30 tomorrow morning at the downtown jail, and excuse my French, but I'm going to send them all to hell. On a personal note, I have so much respect for this man. The loss of a child is something that will change a parent forever. Some act out with destructive habits. But Timothy, he responded with grace and dedication to finding justice for his daughter. Moving to the legal proceedings of this case, Darren was initially arrested and held on separate charges in Indiana, but after sufficient evidence had been gathered, he was then arrested and charged over Cynthia's murder too. Darren pleaded guilty to one count of solicitation to commit murder in the first degree, and the judge called this case extremely saddening and shocking, and an outright assassination of Cynthia. He was also described as a nasty man who murdered for the mere thrill of it, and someone who would always be a risk to the community. As a result, this scumbag was sentenced to the highest penalty possible of 99 years behind bars, without the possibility of parole for 45 years. As a side note, Darren Schilmiller was not psychologically evaluated and had no previous crimes on record before Cynthia's death. But police records do state that he was marked as a person of interest in a case that did involve minors. In short, he was a corrupt scumbag at the very beginning of his career. And as a matter of fact, so was Denali. In 2023, Denali Bremer pleaded guilty to one count of first-degree murder. 
In February of 2024, and just a month before posting this video, she was sentenced to 99 years behind bars for her role in Cynthia's death. As a side note, this came with no time suspended. At her sentencing, there was little positive to say about Denali. She hid her face in shame as the verdict was read, and barely lifted her head during her very own statement. Miss Bremer spent time with Cynthia Hoffman. She knew what she was like. She was aware that Cynthia Hoffman was, had some mental challenges. And she chose to take Cynthia Hoffman's life for her own personal pleasure and for her own personal benefit. The hurt I caused you and your family, I can never rectify in any way. I understand it hurts. You lost a precious child and the community lost a daughter as well. I am truly sorry for my role in your loss. Now, Cynthia's father never missed a single hearing, but the surprise appearance in Denali's trial would be her very own biological mother, who attended to testify against her very own daughter. She highlighted that on the day of Cynthia's murder, Caden and her daughter arrived at her home to say they had shot a friend. She never believed either of them until she saw Cynthia's disappearance on the news the following morning. That is when she informed the authorities. And despite her daughter's terrible actions, she still admits that she loves her. On her way from the stand, House paused to say something to her daughter, who's been in jail since 2019. I told her I loved her, because I do. I, she's still my daughter. Uh, but the choices that she made and the decisions that she, that she made put her in the position she's in right now. And when someone loses their life because of a decision you made, there's there's got to be consequences for that. As for the other two idiots who helped Cynthia and Darren, they are still making their own way through the legal framework. Caleb Leyland pleaded guilty to one count of murder in the second degree. The charges of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit first degree murder were dismissed. His sentencing is currently scheduled for June the 10th, 2024, where he can be sentenced to a maximum term of imprisonment of 75 years, with 25 years suspended. As for the actual guy who allegedly shot Cynthia, he has decided not to plead guilty. Caden McIntosh awaits trial later this year and faces multiple charges, including murder in the first degree and tampering with evidence. According to Anchorage PD's website, the charges against Caden are currently only allegations and are not evidence of guilt. Now, I know this is all a mandatory framework, but let's just wait and see how this turns out for him, because spoiler alert, I don't think it's going to be good. To wrap up the legal stuff here, in a statement to the press, FBI Anchorage Special Agent Jeffrey Peterson warned others with a savage statement by saying, if you're sitting in your mum's basement and you're planning to do some type of crime, influence or conduct a crime in Alaska, and you think you're safe because you're that far away, you're not. We will track you down. We will find you, and we will bring you back here to face justice. Now, personally, I believe that all four of these adults should rot behind bars for the rest of their lives, and although they held very different roles to this case, they were all pivotal to Cynthia's murder. Darren was the one to instigate the case, Denali was the operational mastermind, Caden was the one to pull the trigger, and Caleb provided the transport. To make things even worse, they all fell for what was quite obviously a scam. Tyler never existed, and neither did his $9 million. The sad truth is, Darren was just a waste of space in his grandmother's basement. There is nothing wrong with living with your grandparents, by the way. Just make sure that, while you are, you're doing something constructive and, you know, not planning someone's murder. Of course, you have to be very careful whenever you connect with a stranger online but there are plenty of ways to avoid being catfished. Checking for verified profiles, ensuring there are plenty of up-to-date photos, and using Google Image Reverse Search is a great start. And no, I'm not about to break out or into a sponsorship, but please make sure that your own identity is safe too. There was no way that Cynthia could avoid the fate that Denali decided for her. Instead, Denali's own stupidity cost the life of her best friend. Cynthia was a bright, loving, and kind young woman. She may have been considered to have a reduced mental capacity, but that doesn't change who she was. A gentle soul, someone you could trust, 
and someone who just wanted to have friends. With her strong desire to find acceptance from those around her, she was incredibly vulnerable to a friend's selfish actions, which Denali herself exploited in the worst way imaginable. Cynthia's online obituary is filled with dozens of comments from friends who still miss her. Her absence has left a seemingly impossible void to fill, which is, of course, all too obvious and evident, considering how lovely a person she was. This is definitely one of those stories that simply should have never happened. If any one of those six involved simply confessed in the four weeks they were planning Cynthia's murder, then she would still be alive today. But apparently, all six were just as persistent as they were stupid and heartless. And yeah, you may expect a creepy man in his basement to hold secrets, but the other five were teenagers, and teens are famously mouthy. Thinking about the situation, I don't think Cynthia could have done anything in her position. I mean, up until that point in time, Denali was a trusted best friend. As always, I'm curious to know what you think about this story, so please leave your thoughts in the comments down below. Just remember to be respectful. Unless if it's against Denali or Darren. In that case, be absolutely brutal. Be as brutal as you like, folks. These two are absolute scumbags. If you'd like early access to my content or exclusive content, check out my Patreon here. You can also find me on social media here, most notably my Instagram. By the way, did you know that coffee is known to improve performance, mood, and routine? So, if you'd like a delicious kick to your mornings, check out my own coffee, Classified. Anyway, that is all for me today, folks. Thank you so much for watching today, and as always, I'll see you again very, very soon for another one. Until that moment arrives, though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.